Good evening, Tributes. Welcome back to Tales of the Hunger Games. Before we begin, there is a spoiler warning and literary gore will follow. Without further ado, let's go. The 75th Games took place in the year 75. Following the unconventional ending to the previous year's games, various district viewers appeared to misinterpret Peter Malark and Katniss Everdeen's actions within the arena as being signs of rebellion against capital rule and the Hunger Games themselves. Unfortunately, the victory tour was marred by the actions of these radicals, who aimed to tarnish the brave actions of these victors and spoil the games for future generations. A few months later, it was time for the 75th Hunger Games, which was coincidentally the third quarter quell, with the terms of this quell being very appropriate for the ongoing events. President Snow announced that, as a reminder to the rebels that even the strongest among them cannot overcome the power of the capital, the male and female tributes will be reaped from their existing pool of victors. This announcement was met by rapturous applause, with many capital viewers realising that they were about to witness an iconic and unforgettable year at the Hunger Games. As usual, the reaping started with District 12 and continued through each lower number district until they ended with District 1. However, this year, the surviving victors presented themselves on the stage with male victors on one side and female victors on the other. The first and most contentious reaping occurred in District 12. As the trio of victors stood on the platform, Katniss seemed somewhat phased by her inevitable selection, whilst Peter looked nervous. That said, it was noted by some viewers that Hamish appeared surprisingly calm and even rather reassuring towards his former mentees. Katniss was the only living female victor from District 12, and therefore she was automatically chosen for the role of tribute this year. Yet when her name was called, a tear still fell from her cheek. As for the male tributes, Hamish was originally chosen, but Peter immediately volunteered himself in Hamish's place. Hamish tried to stop him, but Peter insisted on taking on this role of tribute, and so there was nothing else that Hamish could do. This therefore meant that the star-crossed lovers were going to be returning to the arena for another year of the games. They were immediately taken away to the train for the capital, before they could conspire any further with their families and fellow radicals. The next district's reaping was that of District 11. Almost all eyes were transfixed by Bluebell Creed, formerly Jansen, who stood out amongst the crowd and even her fellow victors in a long flowing blue dress, with bluebells running through her hair. Even at the age of 71, she was still the definition of grace and beauty. In fact, it came as a surprise to some younger viewers in the capital that Bluebell was present for this reaping, with many apparently not knowing that she was originally a district citizen and that she had a shot to fame due to her iconic victory in the games. Furthermore, Bluebell had recently won a snow globe for her portrayal of President Snow's grandmother in the film about Snow's life, On Top, which had been released to coincide with the 75th anniversary of the capital's victory. Those who noticed Cedar stated that she seemed nervous and was continually looking over to Chaff. As for Chaff, he appeared to be quite inebriated, and he occasionally looked over at Bluebell and Cedar and jokingly winked at them, much to the former's disapproval. Moss, who was having trouble standing due to his advanced age, had been offered a chair by the mayor of the district. When it was time to choose the female tribute, it was announced to loud cheers in Viewing Square that Cedar would be entering the arena, with many capital citizens presumably not wishing to see any harm come to Bluebell. When her name was called, Cedar breathed out calmly and walked forward. As for the male tributes, it was Chaff who was chosen. Moss shook his head and tried to stand up, presumably in an effort to volunteer himself, but Chaff looked at Moss and nodded in a reassuring manner, which saw Moss slump back down onto his chair. As Chaff stepped forward to join Cedar, he took a swig from his bottle before belching loudly, which caused laughter within Viewing Square, but no change to the rather solemn atmosphere in District 11. Cedar and Chaff joined each other in the centre of the platform and put their arms over each other's shoulders. This garnered quiet applause from the crowd, and the pair looked calmly onwards. An hour later was the reaping for District 10, which was surprisingly chaotic compared to the other reapings. Jocasta insisted on standing and using her cane for support, whilst mumbling nonsense to herself. Whereas Michelle and Tiffany both looked nervous and were clearly trying to avoid eye contact with each other. Alejandro had tripped on his way to the platform, and he was clearly under the influence of Morphling, whereas Jackson did not say a word, and was rhythmically tapping his fingers against his thumbs. Before the female tribute was reaped, 
Peacekeepers had to come over and forcibly cover Jocasta's mouth, as she was now talking even more loudly, when silence for the reaping was needed. When Tiffany's name was called, she sighed in despair, and let out a muffled sob. Tears appeared in her eyes, and even Michelle started to cry. As Michelle hugged Tiffany, Jocasta bit the hand of the peacekeeper who was restraining her, before sniggering as he retreated from her, whilst the other peacekeepers ripped Tiffany from Michelle's arms and led her to the centre of the platform. There was a tense silence as the male tribute was being picked. When Jackson's name was called, he appeared to not react, and stayed transfixed to the spot, and Tiffany cried even further. Alejandro snorted loudly in amusement, but Jocasta then threw her cane at his head from the other side of the platform. She proceeded to call him a string of names that made the surrounding crowd gasp in shock, whilst laughter was heard throughout Viewing Square, before the peacekeepers forced her onto a nearby chair and she continued mumbling to herself. Jackson was prompted by them to move to the centre of the platform, and Jocasta stuck both her middle fingers up at Alejandro, which then forced the peacekeepers to remove her from the stage. Tiffany and Jackson, who had previously dated but were now known to be good friends, stood next to each other as their district quietly applauded. Jackson reached over to wipe away one of Tiffany's tears, and when he used his other hand to touch the other side of her face, this gained a minor laugh from the crowd. The next district to choose their tributes was District 9. Marion, who was the only female victor, had defeat written all over her face. Tyrone could hardly walk and had to use several canes to access the platform, whilst Jericho, who was now blind, was permitted to bring one of his guiding wolves with him onto the platform. As for Daniel, he appeared to be under the effects of morphling, and it took him several seconds to react to each sentence that was uttered by the district escort. As the escort was about to pick out a name for the female tributes, Marion was seen rolling her eyes, and when her name was indeed called, she gave a resigned smile and walked to the centre of the platform. Daniel was the next tribute to be reaped, and when his name was announced, he looked menacingly at the escort before joining Marion in the centre of the platform. Although Marion and Daniel are often alleged to have had many disputes over the years, they respectfully nodded to each other and held their hands up to the crowd, who gingerly applauded them. District 8 was the next district to select its tributes. Due to Freya's small stature and her recent troubles walking, the mayor gave up his seat for her. The other female victor, Cecilia, had clearly been crying. Woof, who had long since lost his hearing, appeared unable to hear the instructions given by peacekeepers when he accidentally made his way onto the wrong side of the platform and then had to be inconspicuously led back to the other side. Zachariah, on the other hand, towered over the other victors, but he still looked like he wanted to disappear from the view of the crowd. Just like in the other districts, the female tributes were reaped first. Cecilia's name was called and Freya immediately forced herself up from her chair and volunteered to take Cecilia's place. Amidst the cries of her three children from the front of the crowd, Cecilia leaned over and was seen whispering something to Freya. The peacekeepers marched over to the women and tried to stop them from communicating, but Freya subsequently backed away from Cecilia and sat back down. Through the commotion, Cecilia's young children managed to climb onto the platform and they made it past the peacekeepers, who were now trying to restrain Freya. The children grabbed onto Cecilia's legs as she held onto them and tried to hold back her tears. As the children were pulled away by the peacekeepers, she finally burst into tears. Woof's name was called next. He appeared to not hear that he had been chosen until the escort walked over to him and showed him his name. He then sighed and walked straight to the middle of the platform, next to Cecilia. As the crowd applauded, Woof put his arm around Cecilia's shoulder and appeared to sign something to her with his fingers, but it was unknown what this was exactly. However, she nodded understandingly and the pair was subsequently led away. The next district to choose its tributes was District 7. Joanna had a face of thunder, whilst Blight showed no expression except for that of annoyance, due to Tristan drunkenly leaning on his shoulder. Joanna was the first tribute to be reaped, and when her name was called, she sarcastically brought her hands to her cheeks in a shocked manner, which mustered some laughter from the crowd. She then glared at the escort as she walked towards the centre of the platform. Blight was subsequently reaped, and he walked numbly to the centre of the platform, without saying a single word. Blight and Joanna held hands and looked out to the crowd, who applauded quietly, but Joanna suddenly had a verbal outburst, which led the peacekeepers to quickly remove her from the platform and into the Hall of Justice, before she could offend any more of the district citizens. The next reaping, that of District 6, was a sorrowful affair. 
Megan and Justin were both clearly under the effects of morphling and had allegedly spent the previous few days openly using these substances in the central square of the victor's village. Idaho was seemingly trying to bring some cheer to this year's reaping, and he wore a furry sloth outfit, almost identical to the one that he had created during his games. Meanwhile, Gregor stood solemnly on the platform, with the large magnet visible in his hand. When Megan's name was called, she hardly reacted and did not even move. The peacekeepers approached her, and it was not until they pushed her that she started walking towards the centre of the platform. A tear flowed down her cheek as she waited to see who would be joining her. When Justin's name was called, he also hardly reacted, but his skin turned an even paler shade of white. He joined Megan in the centre of the platform and grinded his teeth together with little to no emotion. Megan and Justin both looked onwards, and the crowd did not even applaud the pair, which led to an eerie silence around the square. An hour later, it was time for District 5's tributes to be chosen. Porter Millicent was very stoic and seemed to be avoiding eye contact with the other victors, whilst Yvette was clearly very nervous. Samuel, who had recently come down with an infection, was coughing throughout most of the ceremony, but James had trouble standing due to the copious amounts of alcohol that he had allegedly been drinking that morning. Yvette was the first tribute to be reaped, and she let out a painful gasp before silently walking forward and then to the centre of the platform. However, when James' name was called, he almost immediately vomited onto the platform in front of him, which caused a disgusted murmur from the crowd in front of the platform and the capital citizens in Viewing Square. The peacekeepers led James over to the centre of the platform and he tried to embrace Yvette, but she recoiled from him and quickly walked away into the Hall of Justice. After this episode, the crowd were completely silent, most likely due to the surreal show that they had just witnessed from their victors. The next district to select its tributes was District 4. During this reaping, Mag stood quietly, whilst Annie was continually placing her hands over her ears and shaking with nerves. Meanwhile, Pharrell looked nervous, but Finnick appeared somewhat pleased to be present at this reaping. The first tribute to be reaped was Annie, but when she started to break down and cry, Mags immediately volunteered in her place, which appeared to relieve Annie to some degree. Mags was joined by Finnick, who was chosen next. He grinned to the camera, which caused a loud swooning sound in Viewing Square from his countless admirers. Finnick joined Mags in the centre of the platform, and they embraced, with the district's crowd applauding their courage. This led on to District 3's reaping. Wyrus seemed nervous and her usually wordless self, whilst Earth was clearly on the verge of tears. Meanwhile, Garrison had to be helped up to the stage by Beatty, who was his usual composed self. The female tribute to be reaped was Earth, However, as her children shouted out and she started collapsing to the ground, Wyrus caught her. After looking over at Beatty, Wyrus stepped forward and volunteered in Earth's place. As Wyrus stepped to the centre of the platform, the male tribute was announced to be Beatty. Garrison gave him a questioning look, but he nodded back to Garrison, before walking to the centre of the platform and joining Wyrus. The pair then held hands as they looked out at the crowd, who seemed to be grateful that two tributes who were this intelligent would be representing their district. When it was time for District 2's reaping, most of the tributes seemed more joyful and even willing to enter the arena, except for a few exceptions, such as Tatiana and Plato, who both seemed very uncomfortable to be back in District 2. The female tribute was selected and both Ina Baria and the crowd cheered with joy when her name was read. She gleefully strolled to the centre of the platform amidst further applause from the crowds in District 2 and Viewing Square. When the escort was rifling through the bowl full of the male victor's names, a tense silence settled over the crowd. At first, Plato's name was chosen, but before he could even react, both Septimus and Brutus stepped forward to volunteer. This caused a sound of intrigued chatter from the audience, as the two men looked at each other, and the district officials quickly discussed how they would decide which of the men would take part in the games. After some discussion, it was decided that the two men would wrestle in front of the platform for the title, a space was created within the crowd, who eagerly gathered around and the fight then started. For a 63-year-old, Septimus put up a surprisingly strong fight, but he was no match for Brutus, who knocked him out after just a minute of fighting. After being declared the winner of the fight, Brutus triumphantly returned to the platform and held his hand together with that of Inabaria, which they then thrust into the air before gleefully roaring to the crowd. The last district to reap its tributes was District 1, 
Once again, these victors seem more cheerful and optimistic than those of other districts. The first tribute to be reaped was Kashmir. She appeared slightly forlorn that nobody had tried to volunteer for her, but she stepped forward nonetheless. The male tribute was the next to be reaped, and it was initially Flash whose name was called. However, Gloss appeared to be looking at Kashmir during this time, and just as Flash was about to step forward, Gloss quickly stated that he would volunteer for this role. Kashmir looked back at him and smiled, then he joined his sister in the centre of the platform, before holding her hand and waving to the crowd. The camera subsequently showed the siblings' parents, who were both beaming with pride at their children's courage. This year's parade was an extravagant affair. The tribute's outfits were created by the best designers that had graced the capital so far. They were all dressed in the most fabulous designs, many of which featured diaphanous, neon, or electrical designs. Furthermore, the parade was held in a large and open hippodrome, which allowed for more capital citizens to witness this breathtaking experience. The audience was extremely enthused and shouted out the names of several different victors in an effort to attract their attention. During training, tributes were pleased to see that the capital had kindly gifted them with a brand new training center and accommodation quarters. Many of the tributes spent time practicing and showing off their skills to their opponents. It was also noted that several tributes were trying to observe their competition in order to see if their skills had improved or weakened. The assessment this year unsurprisingly produced some of the highest scores in the history of the Hunger Games, with Peter and Katniss, both from 12, becoming the first ever tributes to score a 12. Although it has never been disclosed what they did in order to receive such high scores, these scores immediately made them more noticed by their fellow tributes. Other high scorers included Gloss and Kashmir, both from 1, Brutus and Inabaria, both from 2, Blight from 7, and Daniel from 9, who each scored between 9 and 11, whilst Mags from 4, James from 5, and Justin and Megan, both from 6, scored on the lower end of the scale. The interviews this year also took an unusual turn, with several tributes questioning the legitimacy of the games to Caesar, who remained as professional as possible under this constant wave of questioning. It was difficult as well for Caesar to interview Wyrus from 3 and Mags, when they chose to not speak back to him or use very few words to reply. Meanwhile, James, Justin and Megan each appeared to have been using alcohol and morphling earlier that evening, which made their interviews almost impossible to conduct. However, when the interviews came to a close, the tributes decided to raise their hands together as an active sign of rebellion against the capital despite the fact that they were going to try and kill each other very shortly afterwards. This show of radicalism proved to be extremely unpopular amongst citizens of the capital, many of whom were watching with their children. The program was immediately interrupted, before returning later for Caesar to talk to the head game maker, Plutarch Heavensby, about these upcoming games. The next day, the games started as planned at noon. Before entering the arena, the tributes were dressed in thin black and grey bodysuits made of light material, which some of the tributes correctly guessed would mean that they were going to be fighting in a warmer, arid arena. The 75th Games took place in the year 75, in an arena that was known as the Clockface of Doom. It featured 12 different hazards, and lasted for three days. This year's arena was one of the smallest in the history of the Hunger Games. As usual, the cornucopia stood in the centre of the arena, which was a large and perfectly circular lake this year. The podiums were positioned in the outer half of this lake, whilst the cornucopia itself sat on a small jagged island in the inner section. Stone spokes protruded out from the central island to the shores at the edge of the lake, marking the boundaries through the jungle and in the outer half of the arena. Each of these sectors of jungle contained a different hazard that would be activated for one hour over a 12-hour cycle from the start of the second day. From the first sector that was activated at midnight and heading clockwise around the arena, the sectors were as follows. The Tree Lightning Strike in Sector 12, Blood Rainfall in Sector 1, Corrosive Fog in Sector 2, Violent Baboons in Sector 3, Mocking Jabberjays in Sector 4, A Deadly Freeze in Sector 5, The Monster Mutt in Sector 6, A Paralysis Gas Leak in Sector 7, Bothersome Mosquitoes in Sector 8, Ferocious Lions in Sector 9, A Sudden Tsunami in Sector 10, and Sneaky Crabs in Sector 11. When the tribute's podiums raised into the cornucopia, several tributes near to Katniss from 12 
appeared surprised to see that her podium rose after theirs, but Caesar Flickerman and Claudius Templesmith quickly informed viewers that this was due to Katniss refusing to get into her tube and peacekeepers having to force her inside, so that the other tributes, and more importantly, capital viewers, would no longer be kept waiting. As the tributes looked around the lake, many were surprised to see that there appeared to be no food or water on the central island, but only weapons. Meanwhile, several tributes, such as Wyrus from 3, Yvette from 5, and Woof from 8, appeared phased by the presence of water surrounding their podiums. However, the vast majority of tributes readied themselves to dive through the water and then swim towards the Cornucopia Island. When the gong sounded, most tributes immediately dived or jumped into the water in front of them, but Yvette, Megan from 6, and Jackson from 10 dived backwards and swam away from their podiums. Megan and Jackson both made it to the jungle relatively quickly, although Yvette screamed once she resurfaced and gagged in terror as she waded through the water, before eventually making it to the shore and then through the jungle, while shaking off any water that she could. All the other tributes except for Wyrus dove into the water, and most of them climbed onto the stone spokes that led to the cornucopia. Gloss from 1, Finnick from 4, Blight from 7, Daniel from 9, and Katniss were the first tributes to climb onto these spokes, and they immediately ran towards the central island, yet Gloss tripped as he ran inwards, which left Katniss and Finnick, along with Blight and Daniel, as the first tributes to reach the island, whilst most of the other tributes still swam through the water or ran across the spokes towards it. Daniel saw Peter from 12 running along a spoke towards him, and so he grabbed a knife and ran after Peter, who quickly turned around and dove back into the water. However, Daniel dove in after Peter and caught him when he was trying to climb up onto a podium. As for Blight, he grabbed an axe and immediately dove back into the water, away from the island and towards the jungle. Whilst these events were occurring, Katniss quickly grabbed the nearest bow and arrow from the arena, and as Gloss ran towards her, she shot him in the calf with an arrow, which caused him to fall backwards into the water. She then aimed her arrow at Finnick, who had run around the island towards her. Unbeknownst to Katniss, James from Five had snuck up behind her, and was about to stab her with a sword, but Finnick instructed her to duck, before throwing a trident at James's chest, which killed him instantly. They then agreed to defend each side of this island, and therefore stop other tributes from accessing the weapons. Whilst the central island was being defended by Finnick and Katniss, the career tributes decided to target any other tributes that they could. When Brutus from 2 had realised that he could not catch Katniss before she made it to the Cornucopia Island, he dove to his left, where he saw that Woof was struggling to stay afloat after he had fallen off his podium. Brutus subsequently swam towards Woof as quickly as he could, and as he was trying to stay afloat in the water, Brutus grabbed him from behind and snapped his neck, which instantly killed him. Like many of the other tributes, Kashmir from 1 did not dare to approach the cornucopia, however she ran back across the spoke nearest to her podium and saw that Cedar from 11, who was of a smaller stature, was focusing her attention on trying to climb onto this spoke. Kashmir therefore quickly dove into the water just behind Cedar before smashing her head against the spoke. This appeared to knock Cedar unconscious and Kashmir subsequently snapped her neck before climbing back onto the spoke and looking for her next target. Meanwhile on the central island, Finnick noticed Mags from 4 pointing to Peter, who was still fighting Daniel whilst trying to get back onto one of the podiums. Katniss and Finnick ran along the spoke to where Mags was pointing, whilst watching Peter and Daniel fighting. On a rewatch, it was seen that when Daniel had tried to stab Peter, his knife had been knocked out of his hand by Peter, and it sank to the bottom of the lake. As Finnick dove into the water, Daniel pulled Peter down into the water with him, but Peter managed to get an arm free from Daniel's grip, which he used to grab the knife from the bottom of the lake and then stab Daniel in the heart, which killed him almost immediately. There was a tense silence before Peter resurfaced, much to Katniss's relief. However, as Katniss and Finnick ran away from the central island, the career pack seized their opportunity to grab weapons, and they quickly headed towards the island, yet various other tributes appeared to have the same idea. Cecilia from 8 was running along and adjacent spoke to Inabaria from 2, and the two women saw each other as they raced to grab a weapon. Unfortunately for Cecilia, Inabaria grabbed a spear just as she was about to reach the island, and Inabaria threw the spear, which hit Cecilia's shoulder and knocked her screaming to the ground in pain. Inabaria then grabbed a sword and brought it down onto Cecilia's neck, thereby killing her. On the other side of the island, Justin from 6 had swum through the water, and he managed to reach the island without being spotted. He quickly climbed onto the island in order to grab a sword, but just as he grabbed one, Gloss, who had spotted Justin out of the corner of his eye, threw a spear straight at Justin's heart, which knocked him back into the water. 
When this scene was revisited in the later analysis, Caesar quipped that Justin clear fell into the water, which mustered a groan from Claudius and many citizens in Viewing Square. At the same time, BT from Three had used the distraction of the surrounding chaos to climb onto the island. He quickly scarpered over to where there was a large metal coil before grabbing it and running away. Yet as he was running back to the water, Kashmir saw him and threw a knife, which hit him in the back. Kashmir ran to the edge of the island and was about to throw another knife, when Joanna from Seven, who had also just run over to the island, ran up behind Kashmir and pushed her over, which made Kashmir hit her head on the stone and gave both Beatty and Joanna just enough time to escape in different directions. Beatty saw Wyra still standing on her podium and waiting for him, and so he swam towards her as quickly as his wound would allow, before running into the jungle with her. Back on the other side of the cornucopia, Tiffany from Ten saw Inabaria, who was still busy stabbing Cecilia. Tiffany hesitated while standing on the spoke and appeared in two minds about which way to head, but she finally ran towards the central island. However, just as she was nearing the island, Inabaria hurt her and turned around before throwing the spear. Tiffany turned to run, but it was too late, and the spear hit her through the stomach, and she fell into the water. Although Tiffany did not initially die, she was unable to stay afloat due to this injury, and she drowned shortly afterwards. The final tribute to be caught in the bloodbath was Marion from Nine. She had successfully made it onto the island by inconspicuously swimming through the water and then grabbing a sword, but as she ran away down the nearest spoke, Brutus spotted her and chased after her. Marion heard him running after her, and she could be heard panicking as she slipped, which knocked her unconscious on the spoke before she fell into the water. Brutus approached her, then grabbed her by the head and bashed it onto the spoke with such force that her skull could be heard cracking, and she died shortly afterwards. The careers then reconvened on the island, whilst Finnick, Mags, Peter and Katniss, who were the only surviving tributes in the lake apart from the careers, quickly decided to travel as far as they could from the careers. The afternoon of day one. Starting clockwise round the arena, Beatty gripped onto the coil as he swam towards Wyrus's podium. His back was still hurting due to the knife that had been thrown by Kashmir, but luckily for him, this knife had not hit his spine or any vital organs. Wyrus took the coil for Beatty and helped support him across the shore. Yet once they had taken just a few steps into the jungle, Beatty stopped and told Wyrus that she would need to take the knife out for him. Although Wyrus did not say anything, she made some panicked gestures to Beatty with her hands and it was clear to viewers that she was uncomfortable with doing this. But when Beatty stated that he would be more likely to survive if she took the knife out, she winced and pulled it out, which caused Beatty to cry out in pain and muffle his screams by biting into his arm. However, this seemed to help Beatty, and Wyrus continued to support him as they travelled slowly through Sector 1 until they reached the perimeter, which they recognised from the shimmering pattern. Wyrus then attempted to tend to Beatty's wound further, and they rested there for the remainder of the afternoon. In Sector 2, Finnick, Mags, Peter and Katniss travelled through the jungle, away from the cornucopia. Despite Finnick needing to carry Mags and the group noticing how hot it was, they managed to cover ground fairly quickly, and within an hour of walking, they had reached the perimeter. Yet whilst Peter was thrashing his way through the undergrowth, he failed to notice the shimmering of the perimeter. Katniss, on the other hand, did notice it and shouted out to Peter, but it was too late, and as he hit the perimeter with his knife, he was thrown back by the electric current. Katniss screamed out and Mags looked hopeless, but Finnick quickly got on top of Peter and tried to resuscitate him. Although it appeared that he was about to die, Finnick's efforts eventually paid off and Peter started breathing again. Once Peter was able to walk, the group travelled a little within Sector 2 before deciding to stay where they were for the rest of the afternoon. In the neighbouring third sector, Megan had immediately run through the lake and then into the jungle once the gong had sounded. She occasionally had to stop for breath, and the humid temperatures were clearly not helping what seemed to be the effects of morphling withdrawal. After a while of stumbling through the jungle, Megan eventually sat by a tree, but as she rested, she heard voices in the distance, which clearly panicked her. When the baboons appeared close to where Megan was positioned, their presence seemed to scare her even further, and she chose to hide herself there and then. She quickly took some of the wet mud from next to the tree and lathered it all over her body, but especially over her face before hiding herself within the roots of the tree, where she remained for the next few hours. After the bodies of the fallen were collected from the central lake, Gloss, Kashmir, Brutus and Inabaria discussed where they thought that the other tributes had gone. These guesses were later analysed by Caesar and Claudius, and most of them were correct. However, when the careers decided to head after the District 4 and 12 tributes, they incorrectly guessed that this group had entered Sector 3, and so they headed towards this sector instead of Sector 2, where the group had actually headed.
Gloss, Kashmir, Brutus and Ina Baria travelled quite close to the tree where Megan was hiding, but she had hidden herself by the time they neared her location, and so they unknowingly walked past her. Once they reached the perimeter, they discussed which way they should head, before Brutus eventually suggested that they go to their right, and hence into Sector 4. They therefore continued in this direction before resting by the perimeter of Sector 4. In Sector 5, Yvette had quickly left the cornucopia, before appearing to have a breakdown as she tried to dry herself off on the leaves of one of the nearest trees. She panicked for a while about the levels of humidity as well, but then seemed to bring herself back to reality. Yvette rested by the edge of the jungle that was close to the lake, and she watched the careers as they discussed where to go. She gasped in dread when Brutus pointed towards her sector, but she appeared relieved once they headed towards Sector 3. She spent the afternoon resting and watching the cornucopia, presumably to see if any other tributes would enter the area. Meanwhile in Sector 6, Jackson had been the first tribute to make it into the jungle when he entered Sector 6 shortly after the gong had sounded. He seemed rather dazed as he travelled from the cornucopia, but when he reached the perimeter, he became more present within the arena and he decided to head to his right. As Jackson walked through Sector 7 and into Sector 8, he appeared to be annoyed by the insects that were flying around him, especially when various ones would touch him on his right arm, which would then cause him to walk backwards with his left arm out to the jungle so that insects may touch him on this arm as well. Chaff, from Eleven, had not quite managed to acquire a weapon during the bloodbath, but he did manage to escape unscathed into Sector 9. After a few minutes of walking through the jungle, he spotted some rather docile lionesses. Although he was at first rather cautious about them, they did not appear to even notice him, let alone want to harm him, and he therefore continued through the jungle until he reached the perimeter. Once Chaff had made it to the perimeter, he spent the afternoon resting before eventually falling asleep under a tree. This amused Capital viewers, with Caesar commenting that Chaff was known to other victors as someone who would often be drunk enough to sleep anywhere. The tributes who were the furthest clockwise around the arena were Blight and Joanna, who had each managed to escape the bloodbath with an axe. Although Blight had exited the lake before Joanna, she spotted him entering Sector 11 of the jungle, just as she was making her way through the lake, and she therefore followed him. After a few minutes of walking through the jungle, Joanna called out Blight's name as she ran towards him. He at first seemed rather startled and ready to attack, but when he realised that it was Joanna who was calling him, he lowered his guard and agreed to carry on with her. Blight and Joanna continued to the perimeter, where Joanna inadvertently hit the perimeter with her axe, however she remained conscious. After a few words from Joanna that had to be censored during the re-airings of this year's games, Blight managed to help her up to her feet, and they decided to rest here. After sunset on day one. As the sun set, Beatty and Wyrus stayed hidden within the trees by the perimeter of Sector 1, they took some of the foliage from these trees, and used it to cover the areas of the perimeter where the shimmering was visible, so that other tributes might not realise that they were about to walk into the perimeter, which could potentially kill them. However, once it was dark, Beatty and Wyrus heard a rustling coming from the area towards Sector 12. As they crouched down, they could make out the outline of two other tributes who also appeared to be crouching down. Wyrus immediately placed her hands over her mouth and rocked back and forward behind the tree, whilst Beatty lay his hand on her to reassure her. Yet just as they appeared to be about to run, they heard a sneeze, followed by a voice that Beatty appeared to recognise as belonging to Joanna, shouting to a tribute who was revealed to be Blight to be quiet. Joanna and Blight carried on walking past Beatty and Wyrus and straight towards the perimeter, but when they were just feet away from touching the perimeter, Beatty called out and stopped them. The pairs cautiously approached each other, but Joanna appeared pleased to see them. They then agreed to an alliance and to take turns keeping watch that night. As they rested, they saw the fallen in the sky. The portraits of James from five, Justin from six, Woof and Cecilia, both from eight, Daniel and Marion, both from nine, Tiffany from ten, and Cedar from Eleven were all shown in the sky. None of the four appeared to show any major reactions towards these fallen tributes, but they all appeared rather relieved once the showing was over. Whilst these events were occurring, Finnick, Mags, Peter and Katniss were resting in Sector 2, and Peter was recovering from his earlier accident involving the perimeter. As the sun set, Katniss was gifted by sponsors with a spile. At first she and the rest of the group appeared to be rather confused, but when they realised that they could use it to access clean water, they were extremely pleased, and went ahead and drank water from the trees. Finnick, Mags, Peter and Katniss started to take turns sleeping and keeping watch. When the fallen were shown, Mags seemed slightly upset, but the others did not appear to show any reaction. In Sector 3, Megan remained camouflaged within the roots of the tree, 
which also made it rather difficult for viewers to see what she was doing, but she seemed to be in some sort of trance as she sat there. When the fallen was shown later that evening, Megan crept out from beneath the tree and looked up. She cried when Justin's portrait was shown, before retreating beneath the roots of the tree. Meanwhile in Sector 4, Gloss, Kashmir, Brutus and Inabaria carefully took note of who had died and who was still alive. After some discussion, they agreed to travel further to their right, and they cut through Sector 4 and into Sector 5, whilst discussing who they should aim for next, before they eventually agreed to keep roaming the different sectors the next day until they found any other tributes. Once they had made it into Sector 6, Gloss, Kashmir, Brutus and Inabaria decided to rest as they were now rather tired. Shortly after stopping, both districts were sent an array of food and water by sponsors, and they consumed some of these supplies before agreeing to sleep and take watch that night. Yvette had decided to rest in Sector 5, however as she heard voices in the jungle behind her, she seemed to worry that someone might be approaching in her direction, before thinking for a while about whether she should run or hide. After checking over the cornucopia, she quickly ran out of the jungle and across a spoke, whilst being very careful to not fall in the water, before grabbing a spear from the central island. As the fallen were shown, she ran across the opposite spoke and straight into Sector 10. Once she had made it a few metres into the jungle, she rested in the undergrowth and fell asleep shortly afterwards. The next tribute clockwise after Sector 5 was Jackson, who had rested in Sector 8. By the time the sun had set, he had almost stopped noticing the insects, and he was no longer trying to make sure that they touched both sides of his body. When the fallen was shown, he started to cry when he saw Tiffany's portrait. He then settled down in the undergrowth and fell asleep shortly afterwards. Chaff was in the neighbouring Sector 9, where he had been sleeping as the darkness set in. However, when the fallen were shown, he woke up. As Cedar's portrait was shown, tears formed in his eyes. He then stumbled through the jungle in a daze, before resting within the same sector, but this time he stayed closer to the lake. At this point, he was rather close to Yvette, but the pair did not hear or notice each other. As for Blight and Joanna, they continued clockwise through Sector 11 and into Sector 12, with Joanna stating that they needed to find Peter and Katniss, whilst Blight seemed happy to go along with this plan. As the fallen were shown, Blight looked up, but Joanna continued onwards and they entered Sector 1. Just as they were travelling through Sector 1 and were about to walk straight into the perimeter, they were stopped by Beatty and Wyrus, and they agreed to form an alliance with them. The early hours of day 2. Just as Wyrus and Joanna were about to fall asleep, they were both awoken by the lightning strike in Sector 12, which once again made Joanna launch into a swear-filled rant that had to be censored for later airings of these games. However, the women managed to get back to sleep as Beatty and Blight continued to keep watch. Yet after an hour of relative normality, in which Beatty and Blight discussed what life was like in each other's districts, rain started to fall from the sky. At first, neither Beatty nor Blight seemed bothered by the rain, and neither Joanna nor Wyrus were awoken by it. But when Blight asked Beatty if he was bleeding, Beatty's expression was that of confusion, until he looked across at Wyrus, who also appeared to be bleeding. Beatty then shouted that they needed to run, just as dark red rain started lashing down onto them from the skies above. Blight grabbed onto Joanna and helped her get up, just as she started choking on some rain that had entered her mouth. Wyrus screamed as she awoke, but Beatty could hardly hear her through the rain as he helped her up. Blight shouted that they needed to find shelter quickly, and they therefore ran adjacently to the perimeter, whilst looking for a large enough tree for them to shelter under. Beatty, Wyrus, Blight and Joanna sprinted to their right as they spluttered from the rain. In Viewing Square, many capital citizens even commented that it looked like they had all been fighting and certain viewers of a more sensitive disposition left the square, with some even fainting from the sight of what appeared to be blood. Beatty helped Wyrus, who appeared to be in shock, across the jungle, whilst Blight and Joanna tried to coordinate their way between the trees, amidst Joanna's now rather violent choking fits, until the pair ran straight into a transparent barrier, which had been incorporated into the arena by game maker Heavensby, in order to separate the different sectors. Blight knocked his head rather badly on this barrier, whilst Joanna only stubbed her toe. However, just as Blight shouted out in pain, a large drop of blood rain entered his left eye, and he yelled out in pain and disgust, before running to his left, straight towards the perimeter. When Beatty and Wyrus had wiped the blood from their faces, and Beatty was able to see a now disorientated Blight running towards the perimeter, he tried to shout after Blight, but his warnings could not be heard through the intense rainfall, and Blight ran straight into the perimeter. He was subsequently thrown back by the current, and his head hit a nearby tree with such force that his cannon sounded before his body had even hit the ground. 
Joanna watched on in shock, but she then grabbed BT and YRS by their arms, the latter of whom was now singing on the ground as blood drenched through her hair. Joanna dragged YRS and BT led the way back. The group tried sheltering their eyes as they continued running and choking through the blood rain until they reached a tree that provided relatively accurate shelter from the rainfall. BT tried to calm down Wyrus, who was now in hysterics, and Joanna continued to look out for other tributes. Eventually, the blood rain stopped, and Joanna, who started vomiting due to the quantity of rainfall that she had ingested, agreed to keep watch, whilst BT and Wyrus slept. Meanwhile, Katniss was keeping watch over Finnick, Mags and Peter as they slept. Nothing too unordinary appeared to happen until the blood rainfall had ended, and Katniss noticed a thick white fog that was slowly making its way towards the group. In Viewing Square, many capital citizens shouted at Katniss to run, even though they knew that she could not hear them. Yet when the mist had almost reached her, she raised her hand out towards it, and just as it touched her hand, she screamed out in pain, loudly enough to wake Finnick, Mags and Peter. Katniss shouted that the fog was deadly, and Finnick, Mags and Peter immediately got up to run from this fog, which was now fast approaching them as well. Finnick grabbed Mags on his back and the four of them started sprinting from the fog. They often had to change direction as they ran down the hills of the jungle. However, as they ran, Katniss tripped over a tree stump and Peter ran back. But just as he was helping Katniss stand up, the fog caught up with them and Peter shouted out in pain as pustulated boils quickly appeared on his neck and face. Finnick, who was still holding Mags, ran back to help Katniss and Peter, who had just escaped from the fog, whilst Katniss tried to help Peter back up. However, Peter had only just become used to his prosthetic leg, and he was now struggling to run. Katniss tried to drag Peter further, but he was too heavy for her, and she started to break down in tears when she could not help him. Finnick panicked as he considered how he could help Peter, but the camera then focused on Mags, who developed tears in her eyes as she started to realise what she needed to do. Mags reached down and kissed Finnick as she walked away from him, towards the fog that was fast approaching. Finnick shouted after Mags, but Katniss then tugged on his arm whilst Peter appeared to be slipping in and out of consciousness as he lay next to her. Mags entered the mist and her body spasmed in a frenzy, and as Finnick shouted and cried, her cannon sounded. Katniss, who did not want Mags's death to be in vain, grabbed Finnick and they hoisted Peter up before carrying him away from the fog. Despite having more boils on their faces and arms, they eventually reached a slope and collapsed down into Sector 3. After Katniss regained some energy, she crawled away towards a nearby lake. It was then that she noticed that although the water felt rather painful against her skin, it was helping to dissolve the boils and hence heal her skin. She gradually placed more of her body within the water and eventually her skin was healed. She then prompted Peter and Finnick to do the same, which helped to clear their skin as well and their agility and general movement appeared to rapidly improve after this. During this time, Megan had remained camouflaged as she slept within the roots of the same tree in Sector 3. Down in Sector 6, Gloss, Kashmir, Brutus and Inabaria continued to take turns sleeping and looking out for other tributes. Jackson was also unaffected by the events within the arena, and he continued to sleep in a tree that was deep within the jungle of Sector 8. At this point, he seemed to have stopped noticing the insects that were around him. Meanwhile, Chaff was still awake in Sector 9 after having slept that afternoon. He remained where he was for most of this time, but once he saw the blood rainfall that was pouring down onto Sector 1, he moved around to Sector 11 in order to get a better view. Whilst walking through Sector 10, he walked directly beneath the tree in which Yvette was sleeping. However, through the darkness, he failed to notice her. By the time Chaff reached Sector 11, the rainfall had stopped, and so he remained in this sector and eventually fell back to sleep. As for Yvette, she remained in Sector 10, where she slept on one of the highest branches of a tree, which he probably chose as it would give her a decent view of the cornucopia when the sun rose. Sunrise of Day 2 As the sun rose, BT, Wyrus and Joanna remained in Sector 1. Joanna stopped vomiting and kept watch over BT and Wyrus. BT continued to sleep, but when screaming and shouting was heard coming from Sector 2, Wyrus woke up and appeared alarmed. Joanna convinced Wyrus to go back to sleep, but she continued muttering to herself as she did so. Eventually, when the sun had risen, the group, who was still covered in dried blood, decided to head back to the central lake in order to clean themselves. Whilst they occasionally heard an array of sounds coming from other sectors, Wyrus would suddenly exclaim, TikTok, with certain viewers being amused by Joanna's mounting annoyance. Meanwhile in Sector 3, Finnick, Peter and Katniss were still recovering from the ordeal that they had just faced with the mist. As Peter slept, 
Finnick and Katniss talked to each other, but their conversation was interrupted when Finnick noticed a menacing baboon behind Katniss. Although the pair had noticed these baboons earlier, they were now closing in on the group and snarling at them as they did so. Katniss and Finnick, who were standing in a small lake, readied their weapons as Peter moved to join them. Katniss looked towards the cornucopia's lake and realised that it was not too far away, so she instructed Finnick and Peter that they needed to immediately head towards it. As Finnick, Peter and Katniss turned towards the lake, the baboons started growling and they moved in closer. One of the baboons then pounced towards Katniss and Peter stabbed it with his knife. Katniss shot arrows at the baboons whilst Finnick speared them. However, Katniss was subsequently submerged under the water by one of these baboons until Peter managed to stab it through the back and kill it. The trio then ran down the hill to the lake as they continued swiping at the approaching baboons. Then just as they ran down a muddy bank, Peter fell backwards against the tree where Megan was hiding. Another baboon jumped towards Peter, but Megan then ran out in front of him. Prior to this incident, Megan had been asleep under this tree until she was awoken by the commotion. She tried to look out from beneath the tree, but she appeared to not want to attract the baboon's attention. However, when Peter fell in front of the tree, it appeared that she wanted to try and escape before the baboons attacked him, which could lead them to attack her. She therefore jumped out, but one of the baboons bit her in the neck, which caused her to collapse to the ground. Peter and Katniss grabbed Megan by the arms, and Finnick continued to fend off the baboons. Peter and Katniss carried Megan backwards and down to the lake, and the four of them eventually made it out of the jungle. As Peter and Katniss held Megan in the safety of the water, Peter comforted her, but she died shortly after, and her cannon sounded. Gloss, Kashmir, Brutus and Inabaria had been taking turns sleeping, and keeping watch close to the perimeter of Sector 6. Yet just as Kashmir and Brutus were discussing which sector they should head to next, they started to notice the sound of trees breaking, from the opposite direction to the perimeter. Brutus seemed to dismiss the sounds, but Kashmir gestured at him to be quiet, whilst the sound of breaking trees neared them. Just as Kashmir was then about to wake Gloss, heavy footsteps were heard very close to their position, and Inabaria and Gloss quickly woke up, just as a colossal roar was heard. A few seconds later, Kashmir screamed as she saw the head of a large monstrosity of a creature appear through the tree line. Gloss, Brutus and Inabaria quickly gathered their supplies together and started to run to their right, just as Kashmir's expression turned to fear and she fumbled to get an arrow in her bow. As Brutus and Inabaria ran, Gloss grabbed onto Kashmir and dragged her away with him, behind Brutus and Inabaria. At first, they made steady progress towards Sector 5, but the monster mutt accelerated as it took larger steps towards the careers. In addition to this, whenever its feet touched the ground, this caused the ground to shake, and trees were uprooted when the monster kicked through them. Yet as the group were about to enter Sector 5, the monster inadvertently kicked the branch of a tree, which went flying into the back of Gloss's head and knocked him unconscious. As the monster approached and gleefully bared its yellow teeth and bulging eyes at Gloss's unconscious body, Kashmir stopped running and managed to get an arrow ready. Meanwhile, Brutus and Inabaria quickly ran back to help their allies. Brutus picked up Gloss over his shoulders whilst Kashmir shot an arrow at the mutt's groin. Although it roared once more, it did not appear to be overly affected and it leaned down towards Kashmir, who was now seemingly paralysed with fear. Brutus continued running away with Gloss still on his back, but as Kashmir started screaming, Inabaria ran through the mutt's legs before sinking her teeth into the back of its heel, which broke one of its tendons. Although the mutt's hand was just feet away from picking up Kashmir, it suddenly roared in pain and threw its arms back. As Inabaria then ran forward towards Kashmir and shouted at her to run, the monster started to lose its balance, and as Inabaria dragged Kashmir into Sector 5, where Brutus and Gloss were now positioned, the monster fell backwards, which caused an extremely loud thud and a sizable tremor through the ground. The group marched through the jungle of Sector 5 and back to the central lake, with Brutus carrying Gloss most of the way. Brutus and Inabaria subsequently kept watch whilst Gloss and Kashmir slept for the rest of the morning until the sun had fully risen. Jackson continued to sleep in Sector 8 as the sun rose, however shortly after the sector activated, he was awoken by a rather painful sting on his left arm. He gasped out in pain, but just as he sat up to see what had caused this sting, a mosquito flew straight towards his face and stung him on the forehead. Jackson shouted out again and ran away in the direction of Sector 7, whilst the mosquitoes followed him. They continued flying after him and stinging him on his neck, which made him shout out even more. Yet just as he was about to enter Sector 7, he ran straight into the transparent barrier that separated the sectors. Jackson became extremely exasperated, and as he received more and more bites on the back of his head, 
he seemed to realise that it might be safer in the cornucopia. He therefore ran as quickly as he could, whilst trying to swat away the mosquitoes. As he ran, it appeared that he was no longer caring about symmetry within his body, but when he finally made it back, he looked out and saw Finnick, Peter and Katniss on the shore of the lake. Just as he appeared to realise that he should not risk entering the cornucopia, a large wave of mosquitoes came towards him and bit him on his clavicle and throat. Jackson looked out once again, while swatting the mosquitoes away from his head. As Finnick was in the lake with his back turned, and Katniss and Peter appeared to be sleeping, he took his chance and ran across the sand, which was not affected by the barrier, before entering Sector 7. He then continued through the jungle before stopping in Sector 6. Once he seemed to have run out of energy, he collapsed by a tree that was near the edge of the jungle. Jackson tried not to pick at his bites, which appeared to now be causing him great distress. However, luckily for him, he was later sent a bottle of healing ointment, which he applied to his stings and they appeared to improve. Meanwhile, Yvette stayed sleeping in the same tree in Sector 10. She only awoke towards the end of this time and was not affected by any events within the arena. Chaff was not affected either, and he also continued to rest and drink from the lakes in Sector 11. The late morning of day two. The first group clockwise from Sector 12 consisted of Beatty, Wyrus and Joanna, who reached the shore of Sector 2 shortly after the sun had fully risen. When they walked out into the cornucopia, they were greeted by Finnick, Peter and Katniss. The two groups appeared to automatically agree to an alliance with each other, and whilst Katniss was helping clean Wyrus' hair, she realised that by repeatedly saying TikTok, Wyrus was trying to explain that the arena was designed as a kind of clock. In Viewing Square, this revelation was met with a gasp, with many viewers feeling foolish for having failed to realise this design before one of the tributes did. Meanwhile, Gloss, Kashmir, Brutus and Inabaria rested in Sector 5 and watched this large group of six interacting on the beach. They seemed curious as to what was happening and they discussed what the best way would be to attack this group. At the same time, Jackson stayed in Sector 6 and rested in a tree. He appeared dazed and occasionally mumbled to himself as he continued to check on his bites. Up in Sector 10, Yvette was sent some food and drinking water by sponsors, which he quickly consumed. Afterwards, she looked out from the edge of the jungle and she appeared surprised to see that Finnick, Peter and Katniss were sat together on the beach. She looked pensively at them for a while, but then appeared nervous of the nearby lake and so she made her way through the jungle towards the perimeter. However, after just over a minute of walking, the ground started violently shaking and she fell over. Yvette managed to force herself back up to her feet as the ground stopped shaking, but her face rapidly turned an extremely pale shade as she saw a large wave of water flowing through the jungle towards her. As it moved nearer, she quietly mumbled to herself in apparent shock, until she appeared to come to her senses and screamed. Yvette then ran between the trees as the wave started to accelerate in her direction. She had in fact nearly made it back to the shore, but she tripped over the roots of a tree and shouted in pain as she fell to the floor. The wave then approached and she let out a shrill scream as the wave finally hit her, knocking her head straight into a tree and killing her immediately, which sounded her cannon shortly afterwards. Shortly after seeing the wave narrowly flow past him, Chaff ran further into Sector 11. He watched the group on the beach of Sector 3, and appeared to consider joining them. However, just as he continued looking out, he suddenly felt a crab jumping onto his head. It then emitted a loud clicking sound, which made him wince in pain and then run through the jungle, away from the cornucopia. The crabs continued to jump onto his head from the trees, and he used his hand to try and cover his ears from the deafening clicking, whilst using the stump of his left arm to push them away. After a few minutes, Chaff had made it to the perimeter, which he very nearly collided with, until he saw the shimmering in front of him. The crabs continued to chase him, and the clicking appeared to even be causing him physical pain. As he only had one hand, it also became impossible for him to cover both his ears. However, once Chaff was stood by the perimeter, and a crab landed on his head, he threw it at the perimeter, and it bounced off. He appeared horrified when the crab started moving again, and crawling towards him. But this time, its clicking sound was of a lower frequency, which was now bearable. Although more crabs were still attacking Chaff, he looked up and was able to dodge them as they dropped from the branches above, although they now seemed to be trying to prick his feet once they hit the ground. Yet he noticed that when the crab that had hit the perimeter made physical contact with these other crabs, the frequency of their clicking also lowered, and they suddenly stopped pricking his feet, whilst the amount falling from above seemed to lessen as well. He then kicked some of the pricking crabs at the perimeter, and not only did the frequency of their clicking lower as well, but there were now no more crabs dropping from above. 
Chaff stayed rooted to the spot for the rest of the hour. Almost no more crabs tried to attack him during this time, and he was easily able to defend himself from the ones that did. When the hour was over and the lightning tree struck, he collapsed in exhaustion and rested by the perimeter. The afternoon of day two. Once Katniss relayed Wyrus's revelation of the clock design to Beatty, Finnick, Joanna and Peter, they all made their way to the central island for a better look at the arena. However, as Peter was leading a discussion on what hazard lay in each sector of the arena, they failed to realise that Gloss, Kashmir, Brutus and Inabaria had been making their way through the lake to where Wyrus was sitting on the edge of the island. It therefore came as a surprise when Gloss suddenly appeared from the water and stabbed his knife through Wyrus's neck. The larger group quickly got ready to defend themselves, and just as Wyrus's cannon sounded, Katniss shot an arrow at Gloss's temple, which sounded his cannon as he fell back. Kashmir ran across the island towards Katniss, but Joanna quickly got in her way and threw her axe at Kashmir, which hit her in the heart and sounded her cannon. Immediately following this, Brutus appeared on the other side of the island and threw his sword at Peter, but Finnick deflected it with his trident. Brutus and Finnick fought each other using their spear and trident respectively. Whilst Finnick was distracted, Inabaria threw her knife and it grazed his arm. Katniss also took advantage of the distraction and shot an arrow at Brutus, but it missed. Just as Brutus and Inabaria consequently decided to escape across a spoke that led to Sector 9, the Cornucopia Island slowly started spinning clockwise. Beatty, Finnick, Joanna, Peter and Katniss all fell to the ground almost immediately, and they each tried to grip onto the rocky terrain of this island. Joanna grabbed onto Katniss's hand and Finnick grabbed Peter's, in order to stop them from falling into the water. As the speed of the island's movement increased, it became harder for them each to grip onto the island, which even led Beatty to fall backwards until luckily for him, he was caught by Finnick. Several weapons also fell backwards and very nearly hit several of the group. On an action replay, it was shown that a machete was so close to hitting Peter that it had sliced through his hair. However, as the spinning increased, Joanna was no longer able to hold on to Katniss, who fell back into the water. Although Katniss's head very nearly hit one of the spokes, which would have very likely killed her, she remained unscathed, and once the spinning stopped, she returned to the island and joined the others. They headed over to the shore of Sector 4 and rested there for several hours, but they failed to notice the time when this sector was activated. The Jabberjays started to fly out from the trees, and Katniss was randomly selected by the game makers to be summoned by these birds, and when she heard the calls of her little sister, Primrose, she immediately ran into the jungle. Katniss ran towards the sound of her sister's shouting, but she quickly became confused and disorientated when the sound started to come from various directions. But when she realised that the shouting was coming from a Jabberjay, she quickly shot it down. However, Finnick, who had run in to stop Katniss, became distracted when he heard the screaming of his fellow district victor and lover, Annie. As he ran after the Jabberjay, Katniss followed him, and the mocking sound sent the pair into a psychological frenzy. They sprinted away from the birds and back to the cornucopia, yet just when they had almost made it to the lake, they collided with another transparent barrier. Katniss and Finnick both covered their ears as the birds continued flapping around them, pretending to be their loved ones. The duo were seen to be shaking, and Peter continually tried to bash through the barrier in order to help them, but with no success. Fortunately for them, the barrier finally lifted at the end of the hour, and the sector deactivated. They both seemed to still be in shock, but Beatty, Joanna and Peter reassured them and brought them both water. Over the next hour, they appeared to have recovered from these sounds. Meanwhile, in Sector 6, Jackson continued to rest in a tree. During the action within Sector 4, he appeared to hear the resulting screams, but did not react. At the other end of the arena was Chaff, who was still in Sector 11. He had seen the fight within the centre of the cornucopia, but after seeing Enobaria and Brutus making their way into Sector 9 shortly afterwards, he decided to put more distance between himself and this pair, and he therefore travelled through the jungle round to Sector 2. The evening of day two. As the evening set in, Chaff remained in Sector 2 and watched the events that were occurring on the shore of Sector 4. He decided to remain where he was and he continued looking over at Sector 9, presumably for the career pack. Beatty, Finnick, Joanna, Peter and Katniss rested on and around the shore of Sector 4 until Beatty called them together in order to discuss a plan to kill their remaining opponents. He suggested that they wrap the tree in Sector 12 with the electronic coil which would allow them to electrocute the shore of the lake when the lightning struck the tree at midnight. The group agreed to this plan, and Finnick went to catch fish in the water for the group to eat, whilst Joanna and Beatty discussed this plan further. 
Meanwhile, Katniss selfishly tried to convince Peter to run away with her from this group, even though they had so far protected her and Peter from the dangers of the arena and their opponents. Down in Sector 6, Jackson was starting to fall asleep, and so he climbed down the tree in order to sleep under the foliage beneath. However, just as he was climbing down this tree, he started to hear other trees collapsing within the sector. Jackson seemed to dismiss these sounds at first, but as a minute or two went by and a stomping sound came closer, he appeared to worry, before suddenly running away towards Sector 5. Yet as he approached the borders of the sectors, he once again ran straight into a transparent barrier, before falling back to the ground in a panic as the stomping sound came nearer. Jackson continued sprinting adjacently to the perimeter, but little did he realise that the monster had now seen him and was quickly chasing after him. He ran even faster, but then tripped over a tree trunk and fell straight into a muddy bog. Just as Jackson turned over to get back up, he looked up and yelled out in horror as the mutt, which was now practically standing over him, reached down to pick him up. The mutt's hand was bigger than Jackson himself, and as it picked him up by his shoulder, he shouted out in pain whilst his shoulder could be heard cracking under the intense pressure. Jackson did not give up easily, and he tried to wriggle out of the mutt's grip, but his efforts were fruitless. The mutt then grabbed onto Jackson's other arm, and over the next minute, there were shouts and screams in Viewer Square, as Capital Citizens watched Jackson being mauled to death by the monster. The hovercraft notoriously spent several minutes picking up the pieces of Jackson's body. Throughout this time, Brutus and Inabaria continued to watch the larger group from Sector 9. They discussed how they could attack them, but they agreed to wait until it was darker in order to do so. After sunset on Day 2. Once dusk could set in, Beatty, Finnick, Joanna, Peter and Katniss walked through Sectors 3, 2 and 1 before reaching Sector 12. As they arrived in this sector, the Fallen were shown, and the portraits of Kashmir and Gloss, both from 1, Wyrus from 3, Mags from 4, Yvette from 5, Megan from 6, Blight from 7, and Jackson from 10 were shown in the sky. Each of the groups seemed to be upset by at least one of these Fallen tributes, but they carried on through the jungle. Once they had reached the large tree, they wrapped it in the coil, and Beatty went over the plan again. The group initially disagreed about who should head in which direction, but Katniss ultimately agreed to take the coil and walk through the jungle with Joanna, until they reached the shore of the lake. Meanwhile, Finnick and Peter guarded Beatty whilst he continued wrapping the tree in the coil. From the jungle of Sector 2, Chaff spotted the larger group entering the jungle of Sector 4. He appeared to realise that they would soon enter the arena where he was hiding, and he therefore made his way round to Sector 12. By the time he reached Sector 12, the group were not too far behind him, and so he decided to hide in some undergrowth as they approached. As the Fallen were shown, they turned around to see who had died, just metres from where Chaff was hiding. However, he remained quiet, and once they had travelled a comfortable distance, he started to follow them towards the electronic tree. On the other side of Sector 12, Brutus and Inabaria appeared to have a similar idea. As they walked through Sector 9 towards Sector 10, the lionesses, who had so far been extremely peaceful, started to bare their teeth, and just as Brutus and Inabaria started to ready their weapons, several large lions with rough manes appeared amongst the lionesses, before charging towards the pair. Luckily for them, they were close to the shore of the lake, and they therefore managed to flee from these lions, who appeared to not like the water. The pair then decided to head straight across and make their way into Sector 11. It was then, whilst they were travelling through Sector 11, that they heard Joanna and Katniss, heading down towards the lake of Sector 12. The late hours of day two. As planned, Joanna and Katniss headed down a rocky riverbed with the electric coil towards the lake. However, when they had almost made it, the coil suddenly snapped and the women looked up to see that Brutus and Inabaria were heading through the riverbed towards them. Joanna then knocked Katniss to the ground in an effort to hide her before throwing her axe at Brutus and Inabaria. Although the axe missed them, Joanna ran away which prompted Brutus and Inabaria to chase after her. At first they both ran in the direction that they correctly guessed that Joanna had gone, but when Chaff suddenly jumped out and shouted at Brutus, he said that he would chase Chaff and Inabaria would chase Joanna. They then headed after their respective targets. When Beatty, Finnick and Peter noticed that the coil had snapped, Finnick ran after Joanna and Katniss in order to see what had happened. Peter also ran, which caused Beatty to tell him to stay with him, but Peter ignored this request and chased through the jungle after Finnick. As Finnick then ran towards the lake, he unknowingly missed crossing paths with Brutus, who was chasing Chaff, by mere seconds. Yet just after this near collision, Chaff, who appeared to be exhausted, 
tripped and fell to the ground, which allowed Brutus to catch up with him. As Brutus repeatedly stabbed Chaff through the chest with his sword, he failed to notice that Peter was watching this gory scene from behind. But just as Chaff's cannon sounded, Peter stabbed his own knife through the back of Brutus's head, which also sounded another cannon just seconds later. Meanwhile, Finnick continued running down to the lake in order to look for Joanna, but Katniss turned back to the tree, where she found Beatty, who had been knocked out when he had accidentally walked into the perimeter. At the other end of Sector 12, Inabaria continued chasing Joanna to the lake, and Peter headed in the same direction in order to try and find Katniss, who he appeared to think was still by the lake. The Early Hours of Day 3 The events that followed as the third day began are now known as some of the most unfortunate and catastrophic in the history of Panem. Lightning started to circulate around the roof of Sector 12, which signalled that this sector was about to activate, and it was then that Katniss wrapped some of the electric coil around one of her arrows before shooting this arrow at the roof of the arena. This intentional damage subsequently broke the arena's power supply, and to worsen the situation, it had created a hole in the roof. At this point, Katniss, Finnick, and Beatty, all now barely conscious, were abducted from the arena by a hovercraft that had been hijacked by rebel forces. This hovercraft then flew away towards the now defunct District 13. As for Inabaria, Joanna, and Peter, they were still down by the lake when Katniss destroyed the arena. As debris started falling from the roof, Joanna and Peter took shelter in the jungle of Sector 1, whilst Inabaria remained out in the open, seemingly confused by what had just happened. However, just minutes after their fellow tributes had been abducted by rebel forces, these three tributes were fortunately rescued by a capital hovercraft before being taken to a secure holding facility in the heart of the capital. Over the next year, the Second Rebellion occurred throughout Panem, with the districts rebelling against the capital and rejecting their supervision and care. Katniss became a leading figure of this uprising from the now defunct District 13, which ultimately led to many high-ranking officials and their innocent children to be mercilessly killed by these radicals, even though they had organised and provided for the districts throughout their lives. For the next 12 years, the districts overran the capital, which led to lower productivity and standards of living. The districts even chose to hold the unofficial Capital Games in 78, where they spitefully used their produce in order to torture innocent children of the capital. However, due to the brilliant minds of an underground network of remarkable capital citizens, the capital managed to enact their revenge against each district in a unique way, which saw these districts turn on each other once again, before they ultimately all fell on the mercy of the capital, in events that are better known to this day as the Reclamation of 88. After all, as we still say, the capital will always land on top. Hello, hello, hello. So thank you once again for watching and I hope you enjoyed the video. This one took a lot of work and I think was the most work out of all the ones I've done. It's been the most complicated that I've done so far, but I still really enjoyed making it despite having to do several different rewrites at different times. Also, I need to reiterate that I did not come up with the original story for this week, but it was created by Suzanne Collins and made as a film by Lionsgate Productions. I once again base this chapter off a mixture of the book and the film, but I found that they're a lot more similar um, Catching Fire book and film than the original Hunger Games are, which did make things slightly easier. By the way, I'm still really impressed by the fan fiction and other forms of media that have been created by assistant game makers. In the description, I've included the links of various websites and other works that are associated with Tales of the Hunger Games, and I'm still really amazed, but also humbled by what people have made. And if you enjoy this series, I really recommend checking out these links in the description. On a different note, I need to let you know that there will be no Tales of the Hunger Games next Monday. This is because I'm in the process of moving into my own place. And also, I cannot wait because my bedroom has a small room just attached to it, which is kind of a study where I'm going to really be making all these videos from now on instead of just sitting on my bed making them. With this room, I'm going to call it the uh, uh, the game maker area. What, what What's the name of the circular room where they sit around and make the game? The control room? So, someone let me know. Anyway, I'm rambling. 
Uh, but because of this move, and also the fact that I am having my birthday on the 16th, fun fact, I share my birthday with the real Justin Hicks. But due to all these big events in my life that are happening, and also this seems like a nice place to take a break, I will be doing this for the next two weeks. But I can assure you that the next games will be uploaded on Monday the 21st of September. So mark your diaries or phones or what have you for that date. And we will be back then with the Capital Games. I also just want to remind you all how grateful I am for your ongoing support and your appreciation of Tales of the Hunger Games. Writing this series and getting to know all of you and interacting with all of you and your comments and hearing how these stories have made people happy has really made all the work worth it. I know that we're currently living through what feels like a really bad Black Mirror episode, but all of your constant support has been getting me through as well, and I have all of you to thank for keeping me staying sober as well. It's now been 175 days or 25 weeks since I had anything to drink or smoke or anything like that, and I can genuinely say that every time I see a positive comment or someone simply saying that they enjoyed an episode or something I did in it, it just feels so much better than having something to drink or getting intoxicated or inebriated. And I don't even know if I would have made it to this point if it weren't for all of you. So I just can't thank you enough. Thank you once again for being there with me. But by now you're probably tired of my voice. I'm a bit tired of it as well. And I will therefore see all of you in two weeks' time. And in the meantime, I wish everyone well. And wherever you are, take care.